Hello, and welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. We're so glad that you've joined us tonight. We've had a busy two weeks, and I'm sure all of you have too. Um, tonight, we are going to be in the book of Luke, and uh, we will have John Jones give us a little bit of review. But before he does, my name is Carolyn Thompson, and on my right is... I'm Gerald Winslow from Loma Linda University Medical Center. And I'm John Jones, School of Religion at La Sierra University. <clears throat> John Brunt from the Azure Hills Church. And Ivan Blazer <laughs> from Loma Linda University. John? Well. Okay. We've been looking the last few times here at Luke's Gospel, Chapter 13. And while our listeners' viewers are grabbing their Bibles in whatever version, we'll uh, take a moment to just pick up a little bit. Uh, the stories strung together, little little stories, aren't they? Little mm -hmm. snapshots, mm -hmm. aren't they, of Jesus here and there, a uh, healing or two, uh, an important uh, bit of advice about how we should understand the tragedies that strike life, uh, taking, for example, those towers that had fallen and killed some people, and Jesus' warning against uh, not thinking that you're, you're, you're better off, you know, mm -hmm. than those who lost their lives. Such a natural human reaction, isn't right. it? Because we want to live in a meaningful universe. Mm -hmm. And so our way of, of establishing meaning is to say, well, some, there must have been some, some purpose behind this. Uh, some he a healing of a crippled woman, parables, parables of the mustard seed, of the yeast. These are parables which express both the hiddenness and the explosive growth of the kingdom. It doesn't look like much to human eyes, does it? We, we, uh, the Roman world of that day hardly, hardly could even notice this odd phenomenon of Christianity taking hold. But nonetheless, it yeasts, the kingdom yeasts its way, doesn't it, into the world in ways that are, are hidden, but powerful nonetheless. And so now we come down at the end of chapter 13 to that last little unit, uh, picking up in verse 31. Uh, Jesus steps back, looks at Jerusalem, and pronounces an important kind of litany, doesn't he, over that city. Yes. So we'll pick up there, Carolyn, wherever you would, whomever you would like us to, to Yes, read go that. ahead and read that about uh, the last few verses. Well, yes, we'll pick up verse 31, and mm -hmm. this paragraph takes us right on down then to the end of the chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. This is the Pharisees warning Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That is yeah. strange, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, by the way, happens to be the uh, new Revised Standard Version, those of you who are following along with us. And so in verse 32, Jesus answers. He says to them, you go. You go and you tell that fox for me, listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. And yet, today and tomorrow and the next day, I must be on my way, because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And then he, he picks up and, and enters into a kind of a dirge, a chant, doesn't he? Over Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together uh, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Short, pithy little pronouncements, but several interesting things we'll want to pick up on there. Okay. John Brunt. Well, I think it is interesting that the Pharisees are warning Jesus here. I think it um, is too. That's amazing. Because they tend to be uh, enemies and, yes, in, in so many that's cases. That's right. But they're warning him here about uh, Herod, and he calls Herod that fox. That fox. That's <laughs> an interesting term to use yeah. for uh, a political leader, uh, isn't it? Well, what is a fox like? They're sly. Sly and crafty. crafty, crafty. yes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, did Jesus commit a sin there? 
Well, I don't think so. That fox? <laughs> <laughs> I, I read that and I think, is that gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Well, I think he's mm -hmm. saying something very important there. Yes. Because by calling him a fox, a fox lays a plan. Yes. And Herod has a plan, uh -huh. and he's going to do away with Jesus. Right. But Jesus says there is another plan that is greater than mm -hmm. that plan, uh -huh. and it is that I be at Jerusalem. And so maybe the fox, it's a contrast, an implicit contrast between Herod and the plan of God. Mm -hmm. The other thing mm -hmm. that, because I am an animal lover, when Jesus talks about, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you, your children together, as a mother hen gathers her cheek, her chicks under her wings, and you wouldn't do it. And I think he's saying that with tears in his voice because mm -hmm. I think he really wanted to do something for Jerusalem, and they wouldn't recognize him, would they? Isn't it interesting that he uses such a feminine metaphor here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's, it's, he's speaking in matriarchal tones. Yes, here, he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Motherly. Motherly yeah. tones, mm -hmm. right. Mm. Well, that you were not willing, isn't that, um, isn't that the other side of um, the call to repentance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In chapter yeah. 13, repent, right. repent. I mean, it's like, I, I want you to be willing. My yes. ministry is... Mm to help you to be willing. And here, when it's said and done on a large scale, you are not willing. Mm -hmm. However, I must say that it can't be the only word because what is this parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast doing in the previous chapter but saying there's going to be a largeness to God's kingdom, mm -hmm. although uh, it's in the next story, it'll be composed of Gentiles too. But isn't yeast like mm -hmm. that? It's a small <clears throat> little ball. Yeah. And they put it with the flour, whatever they use. So here we have a bread maker over here. And it infiltrates the whole thing and it grows. Yeah. And isn't that just like the Christian religion back in Jesus' time? Yeah, and that's the way it will end mm -hmm. up with the kingdom. So the kingdom will be successful. Yes. So when you put that on one side and then and you were not willing. Right. I mean, why not come into this, which eventually in God's plan will be successful? That's Maybe right. some don't recognize that the kingdom of God is at work here or that it will ever go anywhere. <clears throat> there must be a question that occurs to other people who are following along in the text here where Jesus says, um, I'm casting out, you go tell Herod the fox, listen, I'm casting out demons, performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. <laughs> Does that mean he had two more days to work and he's going to wrap it up on the third day? Or what's, what's going on here? Well, the, go ahead, John. Well, I don't think he's say. speaking literally there, but I think <clears throat> that that whole motif of Jesus, you know, dying and the, the sign of Noah and being <clears throat> in the tomb for three days three that days. influences the third yeah, day. Yeah, and, and actually, yeah. And, and, but then the, that, I complete my work, I finish my work. Actually, the word there is the word teleo. Uh, tell us, end mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to my end, my goal. Mm. Uh, I get the feeling of a providence that is leading him and bringing him to the goal that God has set for him, and that really is that he be in Jerusalem and, and then be killed in Jerusalem. Oh, mm. yeah. He's moving there. That's the end of the line in a sense. Well, do you remember <clears throat> in a previous chapter, it says that I'm, I'm going to my... Well, he says baptism or something like it, which yeah. is going to be very hard on him because he's going to be crucified. And he said, I'm not looking forward to it. So he knew what was going to happen. So you, you kind of identify with Jesus here because he, he was successful, but I think that he dreaded the cross. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't because of what well, he of went course. through? <coughs> so you know, the, oh, go yeah. ahead. Well, it's interesting that we read this as one paragraph. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the second half of the paragraph has a uh, mm -hmm. parallel mm -hmm. in Matthew. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's very close to word for word. Yeah. Matthew and Luke here together <coughs> talking about... Even the, in the original. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jerusalem part. Yeah. But the first part, the part about Herod the fox isn't in Matthew. Luke is right. the only one who that. includes that. 
Well, Dr. Luke's pretty good. I'll yeah, go with well, Dr. Luke. Well, he also <laughs> has more interest in the political figures. It seems like several yeah. times mm -hmm. he will mention yeah. political <laughs> figures of the day. <laughs> right. Um, even at the birth of Jesus, mm -hmm. he's the one who tells us that. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, in fact, that's it's because of Luke that we're able to come as close as we are with dating the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Luke gives us those historical hooks to hang things on. It is interesting that Jesus replies, look, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And I'm busy casting out evil spirits and conducting miracles and healing and so forth. This is not Herod the Great. This is Herod Antipas, right. mm -hmm. who, before whom Jesus does appear shortly, mm -hmm. and whose first thing out of his mouth is, Jesus, I've been looking forward to work us some miracles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you couldn't you couldn't uh, oblige me earlier by showing <laughs> up in my little trap, <laughs> but here you are. You were so busy then. Show us what you were so busy about. You see, and mm -hmm. I think Luke is going to uh, play upon that a little bit, isn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus, of course, refuses that. There's a lesson mm -hmm. here. Whenever we we who are so <coughs> hungry for certainty. Jesus never obliges our uh, sort of mundane curiosity just to uh, prove a point. He doesn't in his That's time right. and he doesn't in our lives. Mm -hmm. Jesus marches to the beat of his own drum, clearly. And the result is that cheap miracles are simply not part of his way of working in this world, either then or now. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to remember that, don't we? Yes, yes. Cheerio? Another question. Well, another question, if I'm permitted, mm -hmm. Carolyn. Okay, so the three days are not three literal days necessarily, but probably a, uh, a foretelling or a way or a foreshadowing maybe would be the way of putting it of his um, death and resurrection. And then, and then comes what sounds to me like irony, where it says, yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it's impossible for a prophet not to be killed away from Jerusalem. And it, doesn't it sound like there's a little... Maybe Barb in there? Or, sure. Uh, um, I guess Carolyn's wondering too, is this, is this meek and mild, sweet Jesus? <laughs> because if I'd said that, it's, it would have sounded like, um, you know, a little Barb in there. Well, remember, it wasn't too far back that he talked about how, uh, uh, you know, instead of listening to the prophets, mm -hmm. you killed them. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a Barb. But he immediately moves from the barb mm -hmm. to this deep pathos. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to see that mm -hmm. in yes. order to get the whole picture. I think mm -hmm. so. Well, and I am very struck by the fact that the uh, Hebrews, the Jews, could talk about the things that aren't right among them. Mm -hmm. When he says Jerusalem, I mean, I mean, this is the city. Mm -hmm. and, but Jews have a capacity to be able to say, I mean, look at the prophets of the Old Testament, how they can say mm -hmm. all the things that are going on among God's people. I mean, they can, they can talk tough to each other. Yeah. The prophetic mode is to say it like it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus is doing here. <clears throat> all right, shall I mm -hmm. go on with uh, chapter 14? I'll read a few verses. We did, did we read mm -hmm. uh, 35? The, uh, yes. up, the final, the eschatological fulfillment at the end of all time. Uh, your house is left to you and you won't see me again until every tongue confesses, blessed is he. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jesus is simply saying, this <coughs> is it now, until all things are, are right. bound up. This sounds to me like something that would have been preserved very meaningfully on the lips of the earliest Christians after Jesus' lifetime mm -hmm. on earth. This would have been their way of saying, yeah, Judaism had its shot and is now, uh, there's a veil drawn across Judaism. It's off the scene now until the last day. I can well imagine these words on the lips of early Christians mm -hmm. who are struggling <coughs> under persecution <coughs> from Jews. Well, you know, isn't it again? I mean, how often I would have gathered you but you refused you to have. listen, and now you will see. Mm -hmm. You very ones, there is coming a moment of supreme justice when the revelation of the truth will be made. Yeah. And you who didn't really see me, didn't really hear me, you will see me in another way. Mm. That is, I mean, when you're reading them together, that is strong. That mm -hmm. is... But it's also sad. I'm sure he was very upset about that. 
Yes. Very sad. Well, that O oh, in front of Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It also seemed very reminiscent to me of the prophets, uh, mm -hmm. the, the prophets oh, who yes. lamented uh, the failures of the people, who mm -hmm. lamented the fact that the people would be taken off into captivity mm -hmm. and so forth. I, I mean, it just to me mm -hmm. has the ring of uh, many of the prophets. Well, it's sort of the, not sort of, but actually the voice of God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Who, you know, like in Ezekiel, God says, oh, why will you die, mm -hmm. oh, Israel? You know, come on back. God uh, weeps. I mean, the God, you know, the parables of coming up of the sheep and all mm -hmm. that, he rejoices mm -hmm. when people come back, but he weeps mm -hmm. when they are unwilling. There has to be even sadness, in a way, in the heart of God. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> Did you want to uh, say something, John? Okay, chapter 14 in the book of Luke, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. We all know what dropsy is? When your limbs swell up? Remember? Mm -hmm. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. And now, Jerry, would mm. you continue, please, well, with verse 5? Right, and he's going to make a, a point about that. I think uh, this is Jesus <coughs> speaking. That, yes. Then he said to them, <coughs> if one of you has a child or an ox that's fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. They, so kind of my my <laughs> version says, and they had nothing to nothing say. Nothing to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were speechless. <coughs> yeah, because what would you say, of course, I mean, if you had a child fall into a well or in, well, in yeah. some deep trouble and you didn't take care of it on Sabbath, what kind of person would you be? Uh, John, you've spoken about the Sabbath healings before, and you wrote a book on this subject, but uh, what do you add? Well, here again, we have a case <coughs> where this is not life in danger. Mm -hmm. The rules were clear. If life is in danger, you can heal on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But if it can wait till sundown, you wait till sundown. So acute cases you mm -hmm. can heal, mm -hmm. chronic cases you can't. Dropsy is a chronic thing. I mean, mm -hmm. he's had this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so Jesus is again breaking the rules as they have them, and he sets them up for it, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he says, okay, uh, yeah. let me ask you a question first mm -hmm. uh, before he does it and says, uh, is it lawful <coughs> on the Sabbath to heal yeah. or well, not? Well, and no, if you hear that as a Jew, if you hear that as a Jew, is it in harmony with the Torah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say about, what is your interpretation oh, of the Torah? They right. constantly... <clears throat> See? Now, this is very Jewish in the way he sets yeah. it up. That's right. It's confrontational. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, there's one interesting thing. Notice that he says to the Pharisees, which of you, if you had a child or an ox, in other words, an animal, mm -hmm. you'd lift it out of a pit. Of in fact, some manuscripts say a donkey or an ox. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. There were people in Jesus' day who would not do that, mm. who were more conservative than the Pharisees. Oh, that's terrible. Um, we know that the group out near the Dead Sea that produced yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. um, they... I went to see those the other day, by the way. I did Most too, isn't it fascinating? Oh, yeah, I came away with books. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, part of the Dead Sea Scrolls are actual biblical manuscripts that yes. they had our oldest ones of the Old Testament. Yeah. But part of the Dead Sea Scrolls are their rules for their community. When you go out there and, uh, and you <coughs> live as in that community, why there are rules that you're supposed to obey. And they talk about Sabbath. They have a whole section of Sabbath rules in one of those documents. And one of the things it says, no man shall assist a beast to give birth on the Sabbath day, and if it should fall into a cistern or pit, he shall not lift it out on the Sabbath. Oh my. So they were very now explicit these are, these are the essence. in being mm -hmm. more conservative mm -hmm. than the Pharisees even. That's right. So the Pharisees probably thought that they were pretty reasonable, you know. Okay, yeah. let's go on to verse 7. 
When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this <laughs> parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Get this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> Let me give you an example. When Lynn Barnes has a luncheon, I notice I try to go up, Ralph and I try to go up, because we want to see, right? Well, it's nice to be at the front. <laughs> I'm being honest now. But sometimes we sit at the back, and then if she wants you, she'll come get you and let you sit at her table. And then you feel honored. Lynn Barron's could have anybody in this room. Why is she picking Ralph and me? <laughs> and so I'm saying, when you have something like this, we're all guilty. We all want the nicest place. We all want to be able to see well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so I'm just saying, if you put this in a modern setting, it still you holds can, water. It still it? holds <laughs> water. Sure. For our international mm -hmm. viewers, who is Lynn Behrens? She is the mm -hmm. president and C mm -hmm. e CEO e of. Of everything. Of everything, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, of all those titles she has, but it's hard for me to remember them all. Loma Linda University Adventist Health Sciences Center, which yes. is the hospitals in the university. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I, I wonder too, I don't know much about the customs in their day, but um, <coughs> I have experienced old world customs when we go to visit my wife's family in Sweden, and I have seen the senior members of the family when they're planning a banquet. Yeah spend significant time on the seating chart to determine who sits where. That's right. Really? And it's very, it's like, uh, almost like a United Nations negotiation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and <laughs> it's interesting because my wife, as guest of honor, always gets to sit between the two eldest males, now in their 80s. And then it goes around in descending order down to the other end of the table where I get to sit. Oh. <laughs> because I'm not really a family member. I'm an yeah. in-law. You know? uh -huh. So uh, it, I, get, I get placed with very nice people, but I know where my place is going yeah. to be. <laughs> well, it's like in China. When you go to China, they have all these round tables where all these, it's a big room full of guests and round tables. And they'll come and get you and sit you at the table. Now, if I'm the guest of honor, I don't often know how to speak to the rest of these people at the table, but they're, they're doing me an honor. And then they reach in and get food and put it on your plate. Mm. And, you know, it, it's their way of giving you honor and to tell you that you are, even though you're a woman over in China, you're very much honored. <laughs> and so I'm just saying that there's, all, there's things like what you went through with your wife mm -hmm. in those countries. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens in China. Mm -hmm. And if you, go, if you go out with a group of people and there is going to be a picture taking ceremony, mm -hmm. and you just, because I just recently attended the uh, JCI <coughs> by invitation, and they had this hall, great hall of the people, beautiful big hall, all just with theater seating and mm -hmm. beautiful wood and flowers and everything. And uh, here's all these men and governors and so forth, people very important. Mm. And so I, I went up to see where I was going to stand, and I, I stood sort of at one end. <coughs> but And your wife was with me, yes. and she was, I guess, at the other end. But there, was, there I was with all of these people. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Jan Zumwalt gave a wonderful, wonderful uh, speech, and she was honored too. But there was the three of us, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were honoring us and giving us the best place and so forth. So uh, you find this sort of thing all over the world. All over the world, and there's yes. a pretty keen sense, and you can detect it here, of, 
of ranks. What if somebody more distinguished than you shows up? So yeah. everybody knows and, and where the, the place please? is. Yeah. <laughs> well, but Jesus, what's, well, what's the point of it then? I mean, what, what do you think is his point? Well, what's the, the point is, 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 the, is, is the, well, the punchline is in verse 11. That's what I think. I mean, that's yeah. the punchline. Yeah. All who exalt themselves, who are actually seeking mm -hmm. for the chief seats, mm -hmm. will be humbled. And those who are humble, yeah, they're going to be exalted. So this is a lesson in humility, is it not? It's also yes, a theme in Luke, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we those viewers who've been with us through mm -hmm. Luke all the way along oh, here yes. must remember other passages. I'm just going back. I think it's only Luke who has this song of Mary, right? That uh, mm -hmm. and, and remember those words uh, from the, the Magnificat, as we call it, from Mary's song of praise. He's brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Uh, from the beginning of Luke all the way through, there's this sense of, um, what can you call it, human equality, I That's think. That's right. Yeah. Well, That's and right. then we have this, and I think we went through this one time when we dealt with James, but do you remember? There comes a time when making distinctions between people is not just the proper thing to do, it's the <laughs> improper thing to do, mm -hmm. you know? We're in the second chapter of James. When and we're they, when, just about through. Oh, we are? Yes. Well, then, uh, <laughs> yes. <coughs> what did you say to me one time? We're just, we're there. And you said, are we almost through? And I said, we're done. <laughs> but we do have 19 <laughs> seconds. And you started to say we're in in the chapter of James. You were going to bring yeah, that up Yeah, we're Jesus, uh, we're James' brother. Yes. Uh, we'll pick it up next time. Okay. Yeah. And now this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. Until next time, we'll <laughs> see you.